Brother Cleveland, God bless you richly. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here for for a little interview and giving you the opportunity to share testimonies that you had in your life and testimonies that you have according to the visions and your life with the Prophet. And uh, I would su su suggest that you are just starting with a subject that is on your heart and feel free there is we will, we will just take part of the recordings and uh, but we, we for us it's a great privilege to meet you here uh, at the end of your life with 93 years old the Lord kept you the Lord kept you in good health in good mental health and we are very thankful to God and Amen. it is open for you God bless you richly Well, to begin with, I was just a young man, and the war was going on in Europe. And I had two uncles that were in World War I, and they knew what war was all about. They fought in Germany in the trenches, you know, with the French and the British. And they told me, said, you better get in the military and get your training, it says, because we're going to be in this war before it's over. So I took their advice and joined the military, and I chose Hawaii. I always wanted to go there, so it'd be a good chance, and there was opening in, in Hawaii. And uh, I finished boot camp, and they chose me to be a radio operator. I had to learn, I had to go to school learned the Morris Code, and learned radio procedure and all of the necessary things pertaining to artillery. See, I was in the artillery. And uh, I finished my class about the time we were bombed at Pearl Harbor. And uh, I didn't, uh, well, I was just a kid, uh, what, 19 years old, and I didn't know what war was all about. We'd never seen anything like it. But it happened. On about two weeks before the bombing at Pearl Harbor, I had a dream. And I knew nothing about the Lord. Now let me say that, because I, I, I was not a Christian. But I, I believed in God, but as far as... A, living a Christian life. I didn't live it. But I had a dream anyway. And I saw the Japanese planes diving down on us. And I was so close to this Japanese pilot, he flew right down where we were, and I saw him grinning, and he had a mustache. And I saw it just as plain as I was looking at my hand. Well, I didn't pay any attention to it because I never had anything like that to happen to me, and I, I didn't know what it was. I just thought it was another dream. About two weeks later, it actually happened. We were eating breakfast, and uh, it was early in the morning, and we heard the planes coming over, and we heard the bombs dropping, and uh, we jumped up to run outside. We thought first that, that our, one of our planes had crashed because, you know, they do that. And, uh, but that wasn't what it was. A Japanese wave of Japanese planes came over and there's one that came right down real close to us. And he let out a string of machine gun bullets down the wall, it, it was at an angle. And, uh, about six inches over my head, I felt concrete drop off, and I, I knew we were we were being machine gunned by that Japanese plane. And I had a buddy there to get hit in both, right above the knees, both knees was hit with machine gun, and he folded up, and, and I saw him, and it scared me to death. I'd never seen anything like that. And, uh, I, I ran to the storeroom. You know, we had been trained to do that in, in, in case. Of, and I was there, and the sergeant gave me a Browning automatic rifle and told me to go to the motor pool and wait there. 
and said, if you see any Japanese planes or any, any paratroopers or anything, said, you take care of yourself. And uh, I saw that Japanese plane flying over and making a circle. He was fixing to strafe and bomb that motor pool. And uh, I set my gun. I said, well, I'll get a shot at him anyway. But about that time, an American plane came over and got on his tail, and he went out of sight, American plane in behind him, and they never did come back. Well, that was the beginning of Pearl Harbor, as far as I'm concerned. And we got in our trucks and went down to Honolulu, and our job was to protect Pearl Harbor and Honolulu, the city of Honolulu. And uh, we made... Uh, made good time. We worked day and night digging trenches and pouring concrete and getting ready for an invasion, but it never did come. And I, I was glad it didn't because we, all we had was the army. The Japanese had destroyed the Navy and they had destroyed the Air Force, the, the airplanes, and uh, we were the only thing that was left. Of course, we we've been in a fight because we were trained. We were we were pretty well trained, but it never did come. And then later, we fought down on Guadalcanal. I don't know if you've ever heard of that place or not. That was hell on earth. Every disease uh, imaginable was on that island. Now, I caught malaria fever and like to died with it. They flew me off uh, about nine months there, and they flew me off down to a big naval hospital, and I recovered down there. They began to give me medicine and food, mostly food, because we were living out of sea rations, little old small cans, and uh, we were perishing away and the Marines had, see we relieved that first Marine division they had fought the Japanese to a standstill but the Japanese kept reinforcing the island and the, wore the Marines out we, we just so we relieved that first Marine division and uh, I'll never forget it I went up to the front line and there was a Marine sergeant there he was getting his pack ready, you know, he getting out of there, he going home. And oh, he was cussing Guadalcanal and he was cussing the Japanese and he was cussing everybody, you know. And he threw me a pair of brand new socks, I'll never forget it, brand new. And he threw them over to me and he said, you'll be needing these things before you leave here. Said I said, uh, they'll rot right on your feet. And I said, well, I, I can see that. It was raining and misty and foggy and wet all the time during the, what they call the monsoon period. And we were there at that time. And uh, he, he made his way up, out of there and we took over. And it didn't take us but about 60 days and we finished the Japanese. We had fresh troops. We had heavy artillery. The Marines didn't have it. They just, you know, they were what you call a, a shock force. They'd go in there and take it right quick. But they didn't have heavy artillery and stuff like we had. When we had 240 howitzers, 105s, and 155s, and we had some heavy guns. And we, we set that mountain on. He said, we've had 500 casualties trying to take that mountain. And... Uh, he said, we hadn't taken it yet. I said, well, we're here to do or die. You know, that was the old army saying, do or die. And uh, he, he left. And so we began to set up. I was radio operator. And Captain Moore and I, <coughs> we zeroed every gun in the whole division in on that mountain. Every gun had its position. And when we opened up, all hell broke loose. We, we shot that white phosphorus shell over there on that mountain, 
and uh, it set it on fire, and it was just a smoldering ruin. And we, they they burnt the guns up. We was we was mad at the Japs because they hit us, you know, when we was eating breakfast, and we hadn't forgot it. We wanted to change at them, and uh, we laid it on. And our boys took that mountain, didn't lose a man. We lost one man at the top of the mountain. He didn't get killed. He got shot in the stomach with a Jap on the other side of the mountain. But we took it, and we broke through immediately. And it wasn't, it less than 60 days, we had the island secure. The Jap kept reinforcing it, and we was out there on the beach waiting on them. And we had a shell, I don't know if you know anything about the military, we had a shell they called a proximity fuse. And it would explode just a few feet above the ground so the shrapnel would come down. And, and we was, I was on the beach that night with my radio and we was ready for the invasion. See, they kept reinvading, and so we was waiting on them. But they never did make it. The Navy stopped them. So we took Guadalcanal. That was the beginning of coming back. So and after a while, we shipped off and went down to New Zealand for a rest count about three months. And we came back up and we trained new men. We invaded the Philippine Islands. And I was fought on Luzon, the main island of Philippines, 1945. And, uh, we had the Japs on the wrong. They, they didn't last long, about three, four years, and, and we, had it, we had Japan whipped. And I had a brother that fought in Germany, and he was in the Battle of the Bulge. We called it the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, he, he'd make you laugh. He'd say, you think I can't outrun a German tank? He said, you ought to have seen me on that day. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't make a joke out of it. You know, he's dead and gone. He was a good boy. But uh, he, he, he'd make you laugh. <laughs> but uh, he, he was a good boy. Now, going back to this message, about two weeks before the the bombing at Pearl Harbor, <clears throat> I had this dream. And I saw these Jap planes flying down on us, and I saw that Japanese with a mustache. That's one thing that stood out to me, and I saw him in that dream, and I seen the machine guns where it was coming down the wall. I saw it, and two weeks later, it, it, it happened, just like I had in a dream. Now, I didn't know nothing about the Lord, but I believe when Brother Branham emphasized the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. You're gifted, and God does it. You don't have anything to do with it. When, when he chooses you, well, that, that well, I think I'm, well, I know I am. I've had these other visions, and I've had the interpretation, so I know that uh, that gift and calling is, is there. And I had, uh, I had this picture here. A, a brother drew that. Uh, we, were, we were listening to uh, the fourth seal, and I had the vision. And Charles Holmes and I was at, uh, at Jeffersonville. Yeah, at Jeffersonville, that's when it was, that I had the vision. Now, we, we talked about, we'd done heard the first, second, and third seal. And uh, I said, I wonder what that fourth seal is about. He said, well, we don't know. We'll find out tomorrow night. Well, I went ahead and took my bath, and we had to share the same room. The space was so scarce, you know. Uh, so many people there, you couldn't find a place to stay. But we found a place. We had to share the same room, but that was all right. And uh, 
I had taken a shower. I came back and laid down on the bed and he was taking his shower and the light was on and I was laying on the bed and all of a sudden that wall just disappeared and I saw this mountain. Now I don't know if you, <clears throat> I can explain it to you. I was standing like in a valley and I was looking at this mountain and this is a river and the water was black and this is a river. The water was black and this is a river and they all emptied up into one big river. Well, Brother Branham was preaching that the first, second, and third seal culminated in the fourth seal. It was the most horrible part of his visions on the seals. Well, that's what it represented. The three, sea, the three rivers represented the three seals. The first, second, and third seal and emptied up into the fourth seal. He said all the horrors of these other three seals will culminate here in the fourth seal. Now, he, he says that in, the, in his sermon. And uh, I didn't know for years what that vision meant. I never said too much about it. But uh, one night I was reading Brother Branham's sermon and I ran across that. I said, that fits perfectly. Them three rivers represents the three seals. And they all empty up and cultivate in the, in the fourth seal. So I knew then that that, that was, and, and Brother Branham was gone. I mean, he's done pass from the scene. I wish I could have got to him and, and told him that vision. He would explain it more perfectly than I could. But that was, uh, that was that seal. But the night that that I had these visions concerning the belt buckle, I had ordered, and I'd never seen Brother Branham. I'd seen pictures of him and uh, and I read some of his sermons, but I didn't know anything about him. But I was listening to a seal, or not a seal, but a, a message. And I believe uh, the first message I forgot what the first message was that I was listening to, but I was listening to the message and I fell into a vision. I was laying across the bed. I had worked that day. I'd come home, took a bath, and I was laying across the bed and I cut the tape player on and he began to preach and I fell into the vision and that was the first vision that I had. And uh, I didn't know what it meant. And about two weeks later, I was listening to another message, and I had this second vision. About two weeks later, I was listening to a message, and then the third vision came. And uh, I didn't know, and, and I kept it to myself. I didn't know how important it was or nothing about it. I just knew it had happened. And... Uh, I really didn't know the importance of it until uh, Brother Branham began to interpret people's dreams and visions and then told them what it meant. Well, then I got interested in, I want to know what these meant. Now, I went to Jeffersonville and that night, and we was listening to the seals, and uh, this preacher, and uh, he was a minister, and uh, he and I were listening to the seals there at the tabernacle. And uh, I said, you know, I wish I knew what that fourth seal was. And he said, well, we'll find out tomorrow night. But while he was taking a shower that night, that's when I had the vision. I was laying on the bed and the walls disappeared and I saw a mountain. 
And I, that's what I saw, that like that picture. And uh, when, when he finished his shower, I told him, I said, I've had a vision. I said, I don't understand it, don't know what it is. I said, but uh, somewhere down the road, we'll, we'll learn what it is. And I explained it to him, you know, what I saw. So the next night we went to church and he and I were sitting next to each other and Brother Branham began to explain that fourth seal and he said all the horrors of the first, second, and third seal will cultivate here in the fourth seal. And you know he was a messenger, Brother Branham was, of that fourth seal message. And he was a messenger of that seal, and he said they will all come together and cultivate here at, in this fourth seal. And Charles Holmes punched me. He said, there's your vision. said, all the horrors of the first, second, and third seal all cultivate in that fourth seal. Well, I, 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 and that pans out to be true. And Brother Branham said that's the way it was. So, uh, I, I know now what what the vision was and, and what it meant. But uh, when it comes to visions and dreams, I've had quite a few of them. And I, I got a bunch of notes in there, dreams that I've had, and I said, well, uh, just for instance, I had a, a, our pastor, Brother Henry Green, <clears throat> he was a spiritual man and he was in Jeffersonville, not Jeffersonville, but uh, in Ruth, North Carolina. And I had a dream about him and uh, he was standing in the pulpit with his hands upon the pulpit and he was weeping and crying. He said, if you've ever prayed for your pastor, he said, I want you to pray for him now. And he said, my heart's broken. Well, we didn't, I, I felt like I knew what it was because I just had a dream about him. And I saw him in the dream it's just like I saw him in reality the next, next Sunday. I think I had the dream on Monday night and then the next Sunday, there he stood in the pulpit just like I saw in the dream. And he said he, he, he wanted the church to pray for him. And he had had a daughter that had got messed up with a man, and, and that just broke his heart. And uh, it was his baby daughter, too. Of course, I understand what, it, what he went through, because I've had the same thing to encounter, too, with, with my boy. See, he's, he's a drug addict. Will you continue, please, with three well, dreams? <clears throat> now, these visions that I saw, I had ordered some tapes. I had never seen Brother Brownham. I'd listened to him on tape. And back in that day, a tape recorder was a pretty rare thing. It was new, you know. It was right after World War. It was in the 1930s. 35 is when I saw these visions. So I believe it was 19, wait a minute, what, what year was it, honey? You remember the year? No. Oh yeah, September. This is, this is where this was interpreted when he's, let me, let me let, just tell it like, uh, like I remember it. Anyway, the tapes I was listening to is, I'd be listening to a tape, and then I'd have the vision during that time, each one of them, every one of them. So I'm going to go into this, uh, the evening was about four o'clock listening to one of the messages on tape. I was lying across the bed, not asleep, but relaxed, listening intently to the message. I suddenly fell into a vision. 
the message I was listening to, the spoken word is the original seed. In the vision, I saw a casket being pulled into the church by a motor car, similar to ones used around docks and warehouses. I looked to see the who was driving the motor car, and it was I. Well, I, that was the first vision I'd seen, and then, then the vision left me. Now, when he interpreted it, said, that was you dead in sin. You pulled yourself into the presence of God by his grace. Now, that was the interpretation to the first vision. A few days later, I was listening to another tape. The next vision I saw was in the same manner. While listening to a message on tape, I again saw a vision of myself holding a book in my hands, wondering what kind of book it was. The book was old and worn, and scotch tape was holding the backs together. It was about the size of a composition notebook or a telephone directory, about one half inch thick. As I was turning over in my, in my hands, wondering what it was, I heard a voice come above me say, open the book. I opened the book, cover of the book and saw written in large print, this is my servant. Well, I felt sure I knew what that was, but Brother Branham said it this way, the book is the Bible, his perfect sweet Christ, the Word. Now, I've, I've had some reservations because Brother Branham did not receive any glory for anything and I, I, I read between the lines there, I said, well, he is the Bible. He is the book. And uh, that's what I see. But th that's what his interpretation was. Now, the third vision, this is what he had a lot to say about uh, there in the tabernacle that night when I told these visions. The third and last vision that I saw was while I was listening to the message, the absolute. In this vision, I saw two belt buckles before me. One was gold, and the other was just a common belt buckle. Now, when I saw this vision, I was seated at a desk, and I had a golden belt buckle laying here, and over here was a common, ordinary belt buckle. Well, that's what I saw. In this vision, I saw two belt buckles before me. One was gold, and the other was a common belt buckle. As I looked at these belt buckles, I saw a hand come down from heaven. It was just a portion of a man's hand. That's all I saw. I looked, and it come down like that and picked up the, the vision. Uh, was just a common belt buckle. As I looked at these belt buckles, I saw a hand come down from heaven and pick up the golden belt buckle and place it upon the common belt buckle. It picked it up here and put it like that, and then it put it back over here in, in its rightful place. And then I looked, and I, this was gold, and this was gold, and the hand went back up into heaven. Now, that was the way the vision. As I looked at these belt buckles, I saw a hand come down from heaven, pick up the golden belt buckle, and place it upon the common belt buckle. When the golden belt buckle was reserved, removed back to its position, I looked and saw that the common belt buckle was gold also. Now, this is what he interpreted to be. The old belt buckle is you, and now the gold is his word. 
Now instead of your life buckled to your past sins, now you are to be buckled with him the word. The whole armor of God buckled on. Don't miss it, brother. And that was the interpretation to, to the vision. Now let me <coughs> explain something here. When I saw these visions, I was at home. And then I stood that night and gave the, gave the visions, and Brother Brown was seated in front of me. He was in a straight chair. And I was out in the audience, and he set his eyes on me. And when he did, I felt it coming down, his wave after wave, just the Holy Spirit. I, I knew what it was. It was the Holy Spirit. And he was discerning my spirit then. I knew what was happening, but I, I didn't care. I, I knew what I had seen, and I told it like I saw it. Well, when he, he got up at the end of my testimony, and he said, the first thing he said, now the visions are of the Lord. And then he said, I want to uh, say something about the golden belt buckle. And he said, out in the vestibule of the church, there's a picture hanging there, the one with the cow lilies on it, said there's a golden belt buckle on that picture. And he said, that's what the brother saw in the vision. Said it's a golden belt buckle. Said that that's the whole word of God buckled on. And said he's been made partaker of that word coming to him. So uh, I, I, well, I didn't know I was what you what we call green. I was green <laughs> with understanding, but he uh, he under, he knew what he was talking about. So down through the years, I've learned that I've been blessed. I've been blessed with this vision. And now this was at the tabernacle that night. A year later, I met him again. Now this is a strange thing. I asked E.J. Gunner. I begged him to go. And I said, I'll, he had a new station wagon. And I knew my car was old and worn out, and I didn't want to make it 435 miles and, uh, to Jeffersonville, but I had a burning desire to go. I just, oh, I just had to go. And I didn't know why, but I, I knew what the urging. And <clears throat> he wouldn't go. I couldn't persuade him to go any way I fixed it. I said, I'll put in the gas and oil, and I'll drive the car. I said, I just don't have a way to go. He said, well, is Brother Branham going to be there? I said, I don't know. He said, that's a long way to go, not to know. And he, he got the telephone, and he called Jeffersonville, and he said, uh, Brother Branham is in town, and said, uh, we, we know he'll be at church service, and we don't know whether he's going to preach or not, I said, but he'll be, he'll be there. So I said, let's go. I said, I'm ready to go. He said, no, I don't want to go. I couldn't get him to go. So I called Brother Smith, and Brother Smith, and the strange thing about it, they could not get him to go to Jeffersonville. No way you fix it. And uh, I called him that night. I said, Brother Smith, you want to go to Jeffersonville? And he said, sure I do. I said, well, good. He said, how are we going? I said, we're going in my Studebaker. He said, my goodness, will that thing make it? I said, yeah, it'll make it. And I wanted to go so bad. And I didn't know why. And uh, so I picked him up the next morning, and I carried my little girl with me. She was about seven or eight years old. And uh, brother and sister Smith, we took off to Jeffersonville. And we got up there and we got us a room. I said, let's go to Beck's Grill. I said, I've eaten there before and they got good food. I said, we'll go there and eat. And we went into Beck's Grill and uh, we were eating and it was a candy machine right near where we were eating. And uh, 
Brother Smith looked up and he said, there comes Brother Branham in the door. I said, no kidding. And I looked back and I couldn't see anybody that looked like him. I said, where is he? I said, he said, the little man with the hat on. And I had never seen Brother Branham with a hat on before and I didn't recognize him. And uh, I looked again, I said, that is him. He said, yeah, and he had Joseph with him as a little boy. So uh, I said, well, give me these bills. I said, I'm going to get to shake his hand if I don't get any closer to him. I said, this is a good opportunity. And I carried the bills up there, and I had the bills in my left hand, and I was shaking his right hand. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Before I knew it, he had my bills. And I said, Brother Brown, we can take care of our bills. He said, I know you can, I said, but you're my children. And he said, I'll take care of these. So he, he paid the bill. And he wouldn't let me pay, pay for anything. And he, he and Joseph came on down to the, to the table where Brother and Sister Smith were. And... Uh, Joseph had his left pocket just full of loose change. And Joseph, just a kid about the size of my little girl, and he put money in the machine, and he'd tell my daughter, said, mash your button. She said, well, I don't want anything. He said, mash one anyhow. She said, okay, and so she mashed a button. He'd put another money in there and said, mash another one. And uh, so... Uh, Brother Branham was talking to us about the future home of the earthly bride and the heavenly bridegroom. That was a sermon that he was going to preach the next day. See, this was on Saturday, and he was planning on preaching that sermon. And uh, I noticed Cindy mashing the button and had candy and stuff piled up there, and Joseph was having fun putting money in the machine. And Brother Branham just, in, right in the middle of a sermon, he'd stop. And he turned my daughter around, and he looked at her, and he said, that's a beautiful child. He looked at Brother and Sister Smith, and he come on around to me. He said, this is your child. Now, how he knew, see, he, he just had that discernment there. And uh, I said, yes, sir. I said, that's my child said, she's a beautiful child. And he made comments, you know, and he'd start back with his sermon. He was explaining it to us and uh, Brother and Sister Smith and myself. And uh, all of a sudden, he'd stop again. He'd turn around and he'd take that daughter of mine and turn her around and she said, that's a beautiful child. And he kept making comments about her. And I didn't understand what was taking place. And uh, we come on out to the car when he finished his, we come on out and he had parked his station wagon right next to that little Studebaker. And he still make comment about my daughter. And she was, she and Sister Smith had got in the Studebaker and were sitting down and they were back there in the back seat, and he left me and Brother Smith up front, and he went back there to the back seat, and he put his arms around my daughter, and he asked her her name. I didn't know this at the time. I learned it months later. She told me about it. He put his arms around her, and he said, and what's your name? And she told him it was Cynthia. He said, that's a beautiful name. He said, don't change it and don't cut it short and, and don't take a substitute. He said, you always claim the full name. And she told him she'd do that. And uh, he prayed for her. I didn't know that. See, she told me about it later. He, he, he prayed for her. Well, he came on back up to the front of the car and he said, that child is a beautiful child. Well, I, I, to me, she's just another, another child. But to him, it was different. And I made a little statement. I said, maybe it's that Cherokee blood. 
And he smiled from ear to ear. You never seen such a smile. He said, maybe that's it. What, what happened, what happened, he picked up that bloodstream. See, Brother Branham is one quarter Cherokee. Mm -hmm. And my daughter is, is one quarter Cherokee. Her granddaddy was a Cherokee Indian chief. He was the Indian herb doctor. And he made his living that way. He was very intelligent. So that's what he picked up. That bloodstream, see. And, and he, he was satisfied then. After his death, I uh, met Sister Branham. I said, I want to talk to you a minute. And uh, she said, sure, so what it's about. I said, about my daughter. And I told her the story of how he recognized that bloodstream. I said, she's one quarter Cherokee and Brother Branham is one quarter Cherokee. I said, there was something there. And she said, Brother Cleveland, I don't know if he ever preached it in the pulpit, said, but I've talked to him at night and said he recognized the bloodstream. Said he, he could pick it up. And so that's what it was. So that's what got his attention, that one quarter Cherokee. I found out later uh, when like testifying in churches as, as a man come to me and said, don't you be afraid to tell that like it is, said because there was an Indian tribe in Canada, they could not get assistance from the government because they could not identify their bloodstream. And they went to Brother Branham and he sat down and told them the very beginning to the end. He, he knew all the chiefs and where the bloodstream and everything came. And they carried that to the Canadian government and they got their assistance from the Canadian government. So and Sister Branham told me, said he knew the bloodstream. And so that's what he picked up is that bloodstream. Now that daughter of mine, she's in that picture over on the right. Uh, so that explained that. It, it satisfied me. Now, the next day after the sermon, we come out and I got in the studio backer and I mashed a brake pedal and I didn't have any brakes. And I pumped it, you know, and you got a little break on it. And I drove it down to a service station. And uh, I told this guy, I said, I don't have any brakes. I said, there's something wrong with my brake system. I'm dry on the brake fluid. And he checked it out, and he said, it's dry. And he poured it full of, and he said, pump it now. And I pumped it, and he found it. The right back wheel was squirting fluid out on the ground. It was a busted wheel cylinder. And he said, you got a busted wheel cylinder. He says, it has to be fixed. I said, well, can you fix it? He said, not today. He said, everything's closed. He said, I can fix it tomorrow. I said, well, I want to go home. I got a sick woman, Sister Smith, in the back of the car. And, and said, I, I want to get her home. And he s told me to buy several cans of brake fluid and as it run out, just keep pouring it in and says, you'll get home that way. So I bought four cans of brake fluid and we went from Jeffersonville across the Ohio River into a, a settlement over on the other side in Kentucky. And there was a big eating establishment and, and we went in there to get our dinner. I said, now everybody get plenty of dinner and we don't want to stop till we get home. We're running late. And uh, I was worried about the car and I was worried about Sister Smith. She was deathly sick. She was pale and uh, had a kidney infection, what she had. And... Uh, we went in there and we ate our dinner and, and I went up and paid the bill 
And from somewhere back in a hallway, somewhere back in another section of this big place, here come Brother Branham and the manager. Over now, you, you can imagine, over across the river from Jeffersonville, he had preached that morning. He came across the river and he knew exactly where to come to. And then we were fixing the day I'd paid the bill and we were fixing to leave, and here he came down that hallway with the manager. I guess it was a manager. In other words, it was an attendant. And uh, he said, well, fancy meeting you people. I said, Brother Brown, we're in trouble. He said, what's wrong? And I told him about the busted wheel cylinder on the car and about Sister Smith being sick. And uh, now this is after... This was after he had been up on the mountain and it quieted the storm. You remember that? Well, this was after that period of time. And he stopped and he did not pray. He looked at me and said, Go on home. Everything will be all right. And he tapped me on the shoulder. And he turned around and he took Sister Smith on the shoulder and said, go on home, Sister Smith. He says, you will be all right. He did not pray. And I thought then, I said, there's something happened to that man. There's something happened when he was up there and quieted that storm. Now, you can believe what you want to. But I believe that he, he had a transformation of his spirit. He... He had become the spoken word himself. I, I believe that. Now, I may be wrong, but I, I, I experienced that. He didn't pray. He didn't intercede for me. He just spoke the word. And we got in the car and started home. And I was worried about Sister Smith. She was deathly sick. And they, she couldn't even eat her dinner, and they put it in a doggy bag, you know, how, how you take uh, stuff with you. They put it in there, and they said, maybe you'll feel better after a while. So we were driving down the road, I was, and I said, Sister Smith, how are you feeling? She said, I never felt better in my life. I looked back there, and she and my daughter were eating that chicken that she had brought home. <laughs> And her color had come back, and she was perfectly normal. And that woman lived several years after that, and she never did have an infection in her kidneys or anything anymore. And when she died, it was entirely, well, I think it's just her age. She was, had age on her. But I look back on it now, and I can realize that William Branham had become the spoken word. He, he, what he spoke, God honored it. Because he didn't even pray that day for us. And yet he told us what to do. He says, go on home, everything will be all right. Here we go. And so when we got to the mountains, we had to cross these smoky mountains. And uh, I said, boy, these brakes had better hold now. And I, I touched them brakes, they just like, like perfect. I come down that mountain, I said, there's something happened to this automobile. Brother Smith says, what do you mean? I said, them pe that pedal is perfect. I said, there's no give to it or nothing. And he said, well, are you kidding me? I said, no, I'm not. I said, uh, I, will, I want you to drive it when we get on the bottom of this mountain. You drive it the rest of the way, oh, because I was tired and, and wore out. And uh, he said he would. And he'd speed the car up and he'd hit the brakes like that, and you'd nearly go through the windshield, you know. He And he said, what about that? He'd speed it up again, he'd hit the brakes, and you, you here you go again. I said, hey, well, we got to, told him, said, don't do that no more. Said, you upset no. <laughs> but it was perfect. And I kept that car several months. It seemed like about three months after that, I traded it. 
but it never did have to have a repair job done on the wheel cylinder. And it was a back, right back wheel. Brother Coggins saw it, Brother Smith saw it, and I saw it, and the attendant that spotted it, I said, well, it was definitely a busted wheel cylinder. God fixed that too, along with Sister Smith. And he never did pray. Just speaking the word. He spoke the word. I believe I was made a recipient of that spoken word. Right. I, I believe that. At that time, did you go to any kind of church beside the Brenham Tabernacle? Did you have your own church here? We, we uh, this preacher that I was with, Charles Holmes, he had resigned from the little church. It was a little independent church, but they believed in the Trinity. He resigned from that church, and he became our pastor. But he got messed up with a woman and later, and he left here and went to North Carolina, and then he supposedly got straightened out, but he got into polygamy and all of that stuff, and so we, we didn't associate anymore uh, but he was our pastor to begin with. Right. And, and the churches here around, uh, when you said uh, that you would go to, to Brother Brennan, was it for them like a sect? Was he a false teacher or did they recognize it's a man of God? How, what was the meaning of the Christian world outside of the message? At well, they, the, the, the denominations, they did not receive Brother Branham. Now there was a, he came to Greenville, South Carolina in 1958. And there was one man, L.C. Heaston is his name, he sponsored Brother Branham. And all the Baptists, Pentecostals, Methodists, Presbyterian, none of them have anything to do with him. And he had the textile hall. There it was a big concern, a big audience. And I attended every night. It was five nights. And there was an old man, G.R. Thomas. He belonged to the Pentecostal church. And I knew him, and he was a godly man, and he was his mind was leaving him as what we called Alzheimer's, I guess. Uh, his mind was leaving him. And I went up there two different nights and spent the night with him. You know, they had to have somebody day and night work with him. And he couldn't keep the clothes on him. And he just he all messed up. And they carried him to Greenville, and they examined him, and they said his brain cells were dying, and there was nothing could be done. Well, now, he knew nothing about <clears throat> Brother Branham. Nobody knew anything about him, just that little group that I was associated with. That was the only group. But he wanted to go to Greenville. And the his people said, well, yeah, we'll take care of that. And they wouldn't pay him any attention because they knew his mind was bad. And so Paul Sheridan, the boy that I know, he was in World War II and he got wounded and he and I were good, good friends. And uh, Paul Sheridan and his wife came up there and he said, here comes Paul, said, See, he lived out in the country about 12 miles. And Paul and Edith came up there, and he said, Paul will take me to Greenville. So Paul drove up, and he said, Paul said, I want to go to Greenville. He said, well, get you some clothes on. I'll take you to Greenville. He said, and he'd do anything the old man had asked because he was a godly old man. And... Uh, they got some clothes on him, and they got in the car, and uh, there was two boys there. They had an old truck. They followed Paul because they didn't know what he'd run into with the old man in the shape he was in. So Paul got to Greenville, got to the main street, 
And he said, well, Pop, says, here we are. I said, where do you want to go now? He said, just take a left here. Paul turned left, and after a while, he'd say, take a right here. And he, Paul said, he got me lost. He said, he'd take a right and take a left. And said, after a while, we come in between some tall buildings on each side. And said, I was lost. I didn't know where we were. Well, there was a policeman standing there. And Paul drove up and rolled his glass down. It was a hot summer night. And uh, he asked the policeman, says, where are we? And the policeman says, you're behind the textile building. Well, that's where the meeting was going on, the textile building. <laughs> and, uh, and Paul didn't know. And so the old policeman was smoking a cigarette. And he said the old man G.R. Thomas got on to that policeman hot and heavy for smoking that cigarette. Said you, said, you ought to throw that thing down and stomp it. Said, don't you know you set an example for the young people? And he just preached to him, you know. And uh, Paul said, I felt embarrassed. Said, I rolled a glass up and drove off. <laughs> and that policeman standing there with his face red. So he didn't know what to think. <laughs> So Paul said he drove up there and stopped in behind the textile building. So they sat there a little bit and said, well, he said, Pop, said, you ready to go home? He said, no, said, just hold tight. Said, I'll let you know when I'm ready. He said, okay. So here come that truck. These two boys had been following him. They come up there and they come by Paul's car and they drove on up there and and, uh, and they stopped the old truck, and they got out. There was two of them. And uh, about that time, old man G.R. Thomas got out of Paul's car, walked up there, and got up in that truck. And he was up in the truck, and these two boys were standing on the outside. And here come a big black Cadillac, drove right up beside that truck, and the back door opened, and out come William Branham. <laughs> and he didn't say nothing to anybody. He got up in the truck and put his arms around Brother Thomas, and he said, uh, Brother G.R. Thomas, I suppose. He said, yes, sir. He said, you're a retired minister of the gospel. He said, yes, sir. And said, you're a very sick man. He said, yes, sir. Brother Branham said, let's pray. And about that time, Paul and Edith were standing there, they had got out, they would followed him up there to the truck, and these two boys are standing there, and Paul told me, I was on the inside of the textile building waiting for William Branham to come. And uh, Paul said he, he could feel the ground shaking when, when he was praying, said that uh, he never heard such a prayer in all his life. And he turned around and he said, now take him home, said, He'll be all right. And Paul said, before they got home, said the old man's mind come clear. Now, I was at church, at Assembly of God Church, the next Sunday, and uh, Brother G.R. Thomas was there, and he asked the pastor, Sanford Jones was a pastor, he asked him, says, can I testify to that this morning? He said, yes, as you can. And he began to tell about what God had done for him, how God had healed him. And they didn't even know William Branham. They didn't know nothing about him. But the pastor did. He knew he, he knew he was in Greenville, but as far as Brother G.R. Thomas and them, they'd never met him before and never they knew nothing about him. And, and, and that was his testimony. And he lived several years after that. Never did have any trouble. That was one of the most outstanding healings that I've ever witnessed. When it comes to, to the years that you were describing, the, the beginning of the 60s, and uh, you went to Brandon Tabernacle, what do you think the people at that time, did they understood the preaching that Brother Brandon was giving? 
Or was it just they found out? Well, I think I understand what your question is. Or, or did it come later to understand it was not only a man of God, but this was the seventh angel. This is the opening of the world. It was around 1962 when we began to realize that he was more than just a preacher. He was a prophet. That was when they began to talk about it, 1962, because I remember it definitely, because I'd be standing outside Brownham Tabernacle, and uh, we'd get to talking about it, and, and as some people said, you think he's a prophet? I said, I believe he is. And we didn't know. We were just as green as you grass. <laughs> we didn't know. <laughs> but... After a while, we began to realize that he was more than just a preacher. When it comes to, to Brother Brennan being the seventh angel, and you think, when, when do you think that people realize that? I think it was in 1962, 63, he began to realize then right. that, that he was more than... See, uh, well, when the seals was preached, we began to realize then when the seals is preached. Right. That's, that's when we began to realize that, that he was more than just a preacher. Right. How, how did you get acquainted with Brother Brennan? Because of the healing campaigns? Well, the only, only chance you'd ever get to see him, well, if, if he was at a meet, he had it like in Greenville, there was five nights. I was there every night, but I didn't get to meet him personally. But when did you hear the first time about his ministry or in what contents? Was it because the healing, great healing campaigns that Brother Brennan was known among the Pentecostals? Well, he had a little paper. Oh. Uh, it was the voice of healing. The voice of healing, and, and, and that, there I began to read his sermons, and it appealed to me. His sermons and the things he said in there it was more than just ordinary, you know. Right. And and uh, that's when it begins to to work on me. I said, well, you know, I, I hungered to hear his sermons. And then when, you know, tape recorders were kind of new back then. And, uh, and I got me a tape recorder and I got these big reel-to-reel -reel tapes. And I began to listen. And then I began to more and more realize that he was more than just a preacher. Right. That he was more than just an evangelist. That he was... He was different from all the others. And I've been in the services in Branham Tabernacle. And there, there was a woman sitting next to me. And her husband had been a uh, preacher. Jordan, that was her name. And she was sitting there next to me and weeping and crying. And I asked her what, that was before Brother Brownham came to the platform. And uh, she said, help me to pray that God will direct him to me. See, he'd stand on the platform. I've seen this time and time again. And he, he said, I'm not going to have a prayer line. He said, let's see what the Lord will do. And he'd just pick people out and tell them about what they're praying for. Well, that morning, she was weeping and crying. And I asked her what was wrong. She said it was her daddy. Said they brought him home. They'd op operated on him, cut him open, and he's eat up with cancer. And they just sewed him back up. They said, there's nothing we can do. Said he's too far gone. Well, she said, well, I want you to help me to pray that the Lord direct me to that prophet to me. So I did. I helped her pray during the service. And at the end of the service, he said, I'm not going to have a prayer line. Let's just see what the Holy Spirit would say. And uh, two or three people, he discerned their sicknesses. And then he turned around and he said, this lady here, Sister Jordan, said, uh, 
I believe he told her, her who she was, but he said, you got a heavy heart this morning. Said, it's about your dad. Said, they brought him home from the hospital and said, he's eat up with cancer. And she broke out crying. She said, that's right. He said, you got a little pink handkerchief there in your billfold. Said, you take that handkerchief and you lay it on his stomach and said, leave it there and said, he'll get all right. Now, she lived down here in Georgia, so Charles Holmes and I went down there. We wanted to see. We went two or three weeks later. We went down there, and, and that man had got well and went back to work. So we knew then. He, he just, you know, what, what he told about the car, everything will be all right. He just patted me on the shoulder. And he told Sister Smith, said, said, you go on home, said, everything will be all right. He just spoke the word. He didn't pray, but what he said would come to pass. I was a witness to that. Well, what else can you say? If that wasn't a man of God, well, who was he? <laughs> When Brother Brandon passed away in 1965, what was your expectation at that time? Do you believe time is now over, or do you remember that time when he? Passed I remember away? the time we prayed for him, and uh, we didn't know what to think. But I said, uh, "Well, we're we're at the end." I said, "God sent His prophet." See, I was convinced that He was a prophet. I said, now his message is over because he's token. I said, uh, ever the seals and the church ages, that is the crooks of his message. Once you learn about the seven seals and the seven church ages, you realize what who he was and what he was. So... And how do you th did you think how how would it continue without the prophet being on the scene? Did well, I I feel this way now personally. I feel like we're in a waiting period, waiting for the climax. Every little thing has to fall in place. But as far as the message is concerned, we've had it. Right. There's nothing else to come. And you felt the same way uh, 60 years ago or 50 years ago when the, when, when the prophet passed away. When I passed away, I said, well, that finishes it. Right. See, there's nobody else to come along to take his place. Right. Uh, that's the way I feel about it. And I still feel that way. Right. There's, there's no, uh, nobody ever come along. We, we've, we've reached the climax. We're waiting now just for God to do what He's going to do. Everything has to fall in place. I don't know when, but I'll die and, and unless God gives me extra years, but I still believe we're at the end of the way. Were you there at the funeral? Or no, I didn't go. You couldn't go. Right? Uh, I didn't go. I, I had to work. I had a job. and you. But uh, Charles Holmes, the pastor of a church, he was there. Right. But I, I remember that conversation I had with uh, Sister Branham about the, the Cherokee blood. And she said... You can rest assured, said, I've talked with him many, many nights. We'd be in bed, we'd lay in there talking before we'd go to sleep. And said, he could tell you the bloodstream. That's something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She said, there's no doubt in my mind, said, he picked up your daughter, your, your grand, well, my daughter. See, my, my wife was, 
she's dead now, but uh, she was half Cherokee Indian, and her dad was a full-blooded Cherokee Indian herb doctor. That's what he made his living doing. And he was good because he treated people that, that uh, people told me about him. Right. So he, but uh, I'm so glad that, now as far as I'm concerned, we're not to look for anything else. I don't think. I don't think there's going to ever be a, another prophet or any, there's no scripture for it. Right. Right, he said so. So, but. Right. <laughs> now, just wonderful to, 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 to have a view of, of you being a visitor at Brenham's Tabernacle in, in those years, right? Yeah, I've, I've been up there every chance I got. Do you remember that when, when, when Brother Branham passed away, that there were any kind that the newspapers was, was saying something about this? Do you remember some article about that? Well, the only thing that I ever saw in the local paper is just a little article that said that William Branham, a world-known evangelist, had died. Right. And that's about all it had to say about him. Right. But he was rejected. He was rejected by all your denominations. Even the Pentecostal people wouldn't have anything to do with him. Right. They, and the Methodists and the Baptists and the Presbyterian, no. They wouldn't have anything to do with him. What, was it because of his doctrine? I think so. Yeah, yeah. Well, <clears throat> just like... Uh, up here at Greenville. Now, he was five nights up there. There was one man, one man, L.C. Heaston, was the only man that supported him, and he was independent. All the rest of the Assemblies of God, the Pentecostal Holiness, the Presbyterian, the Methodist, the Baptist, no go. Right. Were they even warned to go to his meetings, or were they allowed to go? Oh, no, it was worldwide. They, they, they'd send in people to, to, to talk to him and all. Just like a pastor of our church, he was simply a God. He said, we don't say anything against him, we just don't agree with him. Right. That's what they put, and, and, and the organization Assemblies of God, you see, that was a big organization, and it still is. And uh, there's stories about healings that took place. The Assembly of God, they should have, but he had to preach what they wanted preached, and he wouldn't do it. Right. That's, that's where the trouble comes. And that was a big organization. See, the pastor of our church was simply God. You had Pentecostal wholeness. They wouldn't have anything to do with him. Just like he was poisoned. Right. Because he did not agree with everything that they taught. I understand that, yeah. <laughs> right. Did you ever, ever get problems from from believers here when you said that you will go to brother Branham's meeting did you oh they they'd you? laugh they'd laugh at me now let me tell you what happened to me my aunt she brought me the little book William Branham a man sent from God her son John Marshall first cousin of mine was going to college in Cleveland Tennessee Church of God that's where I had a big college there, and he was attending that college, training to be a uh, Church of God preacher. She brought me the book, William Branham, A Man Sent from God. And I read that book. I got done with it about 3 o'clock in the morning. I couldn't lay it down until I finished it. And I got down on my knees, and I prayed. I said, Lord... Help me to see this man before I die. I want to be in one of his services. 
It really touched my heart. See, God was reaching out for me. But they, she and her son and her family, they, they wouldn't have nothing to do with it. And yet they were the ones that brought me the literature. Right, right. Ain't that strange? Right. Well, that's what happened. She brought the book here to my house, and, and, and she heard that I was going to go up there. I went to Jeffersonville and was baptized. And she heard about it, and she, she called my mother and said, I want to talk to Gerald before he goes up there. I said, I want to straighten him out. And I said, well, I'll go up. I took my Bible. I went up to see Aunt Euler. And uh, she said, don't you realize you're making a bad mistake? I said, well, you'll have to show me. And uh, she said, well, I can do it. I said, well, get your Bible and show me where I'm wrong. And uh, I said, there's one thing I asked you to do. Prove to me by the word of God that somebody has ever been baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, I said, and I won't go. I'll come join your church. Oh, I can do that. And she looked and she looked and she looked and she couldn't find it. She said, well, said, what difference does it make? And she closed her Bible up. She didn't well, argue with me anymore. I said, just one place. Just one place. Show me where anybody has ever been baptized in the Trinity. And I'll, and she, she just couldn't believe that. And I showed it to her. And <laughs> well, her son, she's dead. Her son's still living, and he thinks the world of me, but he don't agree with me. Is that strange? They weren't predestinated. If they were predestinated, they would see it just like, But if, if that calling is not there, that it's, it's just not there. Thank God he called me. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. So if you could say, maybe it's the last point, either you have, you have something which is on your actual question, but uh, if you could say something for the younger generation who is now, they never saw the prophets, but they are raised in the message. Is there some advice that you could give to them? Well, the only thing I could say, when our church, we have testimony meetings, you know, uh, in the church, you know how, well, that's when I have a chance to, to tell the young people, <laughs> you've seen what I've seen, you wouldn't be wondering whether you should believe or not believe. I said, you see what I've seen. And I, and I try to encourage them. And I've had, I've had some young people come to me and said they've enjoyed it. They, they really believed it. That I had the experience. I said, I know I have. I'm thankful to God Almighty. Right. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Brother Cleveland, it was a pleasure to hear all these testimonies. It's part of your life. And uh, we're very, very thankful that you took your time. Now, we were in the Philippine campaign. We did, took Guadalcanal and we took all these other islands and we were up in Luzon, the big... And we were moving up to the front. We had our artilleries and uh, guns and everything, big trucks, and we was moving on up. We'd push the Japs back up into the mountains. And all of a sudden, with the Putman River Valley, shells began to fall in on top of us. And we stopped the trucks. Now, I don't know how you trained in Germany, but I know how you trained with, with the Americans. You get caught in artillery fire, you hit the ground. You don't lay on your face, you lay on your back. And you pull your helmet over you and pull that chin strap tight. You lay your arms across your body like that, and that's the only protection you got. If shrapnel should hit, it protects your head. If shrapnel hit, you hit your arms and, instead of your heart and your lungs, and you, you want to lay on your back to, to protect your spinal cord. That's, 
So that's the, the training we had, and which is good. And I was laying there, and the shells is falling, and men getting hit, and shrapnel were flying. And there's a voice spoke to me and said, where would you go if you got hit? And I knew it was God. And I said, Lord, you help me get out of this war, and don't let my body get tore up like my buddies, and I'll live for you when I get home. And uh, all of a sudden, the shells stopped falling. I didn't get hit. I come home. I forgot all about that promise. I just like all GIs, they're scared to death. They make all kind of, kind of promises, and then when the danger's over, they forget about it. Well, I, I was like that. And I came home, and my mother-in-law wanted to go to a tent meeting. This is after the war was over. And she wanted to go to a tent meeting up here at the fairground. There was an evangelist by the name of Thea Jones. And he had come out. He'd come independent. And he was, had a healing campaign. And he was getting results. And uh, she didn't have nobody to take her. Now, I didn't go to church anywhere. I didn't, I didn't attend church. And... Uh, she, she asked me to take her up there, and I said, sure, I'll take you. I liked the woman, so I got it, you know, carried her up there. And I was sitting there, and he was preaching, and uh, he'd done preached his sermon, and he was praying for the sick. And there was a woman come up on the platform, and he was praying for her, and all of a sudden he stopped. He spun around, he pointed his finger right straight at me, he said, how many of you soldiers promised God that if he'd take care of you and bring you home in one piece that you'd live for him when you got home and you failed to keep your promise? Told me exactly the words that I, I mentioned to God. I said, surely this is it. And I felt that Holy Spirit run up and down my spine. I knew then there was something going on. And so I decided that night, that's when I got converted, I got up and went back to the prayer section and, uh, and, and, and I gave my heart to the Lord. But I remember that. I promised the Lord that I'd do that. But that preacher told me exactly the words that I told God. I said, if you'll bring me home and let me come home in one piece and not get my wounded and my body tore up. I'll live for you. Right. And he told me them the very words. I said, this is it. That's how I got converted. <laughs> and it's got Gerald Cleveland, Anderson, South Carolina, and that's all it's had. And I got it. It didn't have my street number, my house number, or nothing. But it's just my name, Anderson, South Carolina. I opened it up, and it was a letter from Canada. A woman wrote me, and she said, I don't know if you'll ever receive this letter or not. Says, all I had was your book, you know, the, the story in the book. Said that that was all it said, Anderson. And, and I got the letter. So I sat down, and, and I sent her a copy of my testimony. It was on cassette tape. Back then, you see, they didn't have modern stuff they got now. But that was a strange thing. And then I gave a testimony down in Alabama, and there was a woman there, and I looked for her letter, and it's from Austria. And she wrote me and sent me $20. She wanted a copy of my testimony. And... Uh, of course, I sent her money back to her, and I sent her a copy. But she said they had somebody over there that could interpret the from English into the Austrian language. And, and I looked for that. I thought maybe if, if I could contact you, you could go yeah. see about it. Yeah. But I can't find her letter. I've looked for it. Right. I would certainly do it. There was a brother, Francis, from West Virginia, 
And I first met him over here in Georgia at a church. And he called me one day on the phone and he said, I want you to pray for my mother. He said, she's got something wrong in, internally and says they can't find it. They don't know what it is. I'm quoting from memory and I may not be, my wife might could help you, I don't know. Anyway, <clears throat> In the, he, in the telephone conversation, he said, we don't know what it is, and said they want to operate, do an exploratory operation. And uh, I said, well, I'll pray about it. So that night, I had a dream. Of, I saw a human body lying there, and I saw the internal part, and I didn't know what I was looking at, but I seen a growth. I believe it was two or three growths. Three spots on the back of it. On, on the back of her, uh, uh, what is that? What I are they called? Say it was the pancreas. Pancreas. Yes, that's what it was. It lay on like this, and I saw three spots on the back side of the pancreas, and uh, I told him. I, I called him and told him. I said, "You tell the doctor." to look at the back side of the pancreas. They was checking it from this side. I said, to x-ray the back side. And, uh, and uh, I described the, the, I didn't even know what I was looking at. It was a portion and I got the medical book down and I said, that's it, the pancreas. So he, uh, he told me he would. And so he, I said, let me know. I said, there's something there. And so he told the doctor the next day, the doctor said, well, I done checked the pancreas. He said, you didn't check the backside. He said, that's where the growth is. And so the doctor told him he would, and he checked it, and he said, uh, he found two of them. And this preacher told him, Brother Francis told him, said, there's another one. Said, that man told me there was three of them and said, yeah, I believe him. And he said, I'll go back and check and said, they found it. They found three spots on the back side of the pancreas. And that was what, called, and the doctor said, we can treat that medically. And the last we got, she got well. They, they gave her medicine to take care of that growth, whatever it was. Right, right. But I, it was a strange thing. You just see these things, and just like uh, uh, the thing stood out to me is Brother Henry Green. He had a daughter. They got married, and she got messed up in her marriage, and it broke his heart. Cause he he loved that daughter, and uh, he, I saw him, and I told my wife about it before we went to church. I said, "There's something bad wrong with Brother Henry Green." I said, "I seen him standing in the pulpit, had a hold of the pulpit, and he was weeping and crying, and said, if you've ever prayed for your pastor,' said, I want you to pray for him now.'" I said, and we got up and went down to the front. I said, some people just got up just because they, they thought that was the right thing to do. Uh, I said, but some people were sincere, you know. You could tell, I could tell. In the dream, I could tell whether they were sincere or where they wasn't sincere. And uh, we was weeping and crying. And the next Sunday now, that was long about Tuesday of... The next Sunday we went to church and it happened. Just exactly. My wife and I, he come out and he was weeping and crying. He said, if you ever pray for your prayer, I done heard it in the dream. And I, that's the way things happen. And uh, They might would like to hear the one about Brother Neville's daughter. Oh yeah, that's recently. Well, years ago, several years ago, up at Ruth. The one that, yeah, oh, Brother Neville, his daughter married this fellow Grant, and uh, 
they had moved from Jeffersonville down to this area. They was living up there in Greenville. And uh, we went to church at, at Ruth, North Carolina, where Brother Henry Green was pastor. And this girl and her three daughters and one boy attended church there, but her husband didn't come with her. And uh, one morning we was praying and I s went into a vision and I saw a hand raised and I heard weeping and crying. And I knew whose hand it was. It was hers. And I never spoke to her. Never, we never carried on a conversation with her. Just knew her at church and shook hands. And I saw her hand and I knew it was her. So after the church, I didn't feel like saying anything in the church. And I told my wife, I said, now, I got to see that Sister Grant. I said, there's something I, I just seen in, in the church there. Her hand was waiting, and I heard her weeping. And so I called her aside, and my wife come with me. And uh, I said, uh, you've got a heavy heart. I said, uh, what, what did I tell her? You said there's something wrong, but said, uh, said you just rest assured God will take care of the problem. Yeah, I, I said there's something wrong in your home. I said, that's what I said. I said, the Lord didn't show me what. I said, but I seen you weeping and crying. I said, and, and she, when I said that I seen you weeping and crying, she busted out crying. She ripped her hands and she said, I've been praying that the Lord would reveal it to you. Said, I knew you was a spiritual man. See, that was Brother Neville's daughter, the one that, that was pastor of the Random Tabernacle. Right. And uh, I said, don't you worry about it. I said, we'll pray. And I said, God will see about it. Right. Two weeks later, it was about two weeks, wasn't it? She come walking into church and her husband was with her. Right. They had been separated. They had been separated. Of course, we didn't know anything. And we didn't know anything about that. Right. They'd been separated, and uh, he had uh, done moved out yeah. and go apply for a divorce. And she was broke up and uh, crying about it. So they invited us to their home. We went over there, and Brother Bannister and I was with us, and we went, went walking around hit this man's place. He had a pretty place. We got to a barn where a big machine was sitting and he opened the door and he said, this is where an angel of God met me and told me what to do. And said, so that's what brought our home back together. Yeah, right. I thought, wow, how wonderful Amen. for God to step in and but Sister Neville, uh, or Sister Grant, she she was a Neville, and Brother Neville's daughter. She said, "I knew you was a spiritual man." Said, "I knew that." Right, right. And said, "I never realized it would come like this." Right, right. Uh, it's how wonderful. Right. Is she is she following the message of the hour, Sister Sister ne Neville's daughter? Oh yes, well, as far as I know, this sure. this man, they moved from there out to Tennessee. I think they go to Brother, uh, what's his name? Donnie Reagan's. Donnie, Donnie Reagan's church. Yeah, right. last I heard report. Oh, no, just wonderful, right? And then they they go there. That that's where they attend. I, I used to have contact with Brother George Smith. He came to uh, Luke Gibson's church here at Townville. And he sent me word that he wanted to see me, so I went out there. Yeah, I, I know your brother George right. Smith.